As a follow up to the popular video write up on this channel for the beginner reversing challenge from the 2020 Google Capture the Flag competition, let's also take a look at another one of Google's self rated easy challenges, specifically the write only problem from the sandbox category. Full disclosure, I didn't solve this challenge during the competition. My teammate Cedric did. Instead, I spent the rest of my weekend failing to solve any more challenges from the reversing category. But those fun times are behind us now and sandbox challenges are always interesting, so let's take some time to figure this one out too. To start, let's read the challenge description and see what we are dealing with here. This sandbox executes any shell code you send, but thanks to seccomp, you won't be able to read slash home slash user slash flag. We also have a remote service with a port and an attachment to download. Downloading the attachment and extracting the archive, we are presented with a makefile, a compiled binary, and some source code. Let's assume the binary is compiled from the source and start looking at that code. Starting with the main function, we can see that the parent process forks a child process. This fork function has the effect of creating a new process by duplicating the calling process. After this new process is created, both the parent process and child process will execute the next instruction following the fork system call. So in this case, they will both start to evaluate this not PID condition. But how can we know who is the parent process and who is the child process? Well, we can find that out by testing the value returned by the fork call. A value of zero is returned to the newly created child process positive value, which is the child's process ID, is returned to the existing parent process. So based on these return values and the not process ID boolean check, we can see that the child process enters into this check flag loop. The parent process, however, would continue past this loop and print out the returned child's process ID in this debug statement. After printing out the process ID, the parent process reads shellcode from the user by first asking for the shellcode length, creating executable space in memory based on that length, then reading the user's shellcode into that memory location and returning a void function pointer. Later, the shellcode is directly executed. Okay, great, this looks pretty easy, right? Ignoring that fork and child stuff, we can just send some shellcode to the application, it will execute it, and bam, we have remote code execution by design. But this is the Google CTF, remember? It's not going to be quite so easy. Firstly, let's take a look at that setup underscore setcomp function, which we conveniently skipped over when our remote code execution excitement started to kick in. Okay, so now we can see why this challenge is in the sandbox category. In CTFs, and indeed with security in general, a sandbox is just an isolated environment, usually with stricter rules or less access than the regular environment. A sandbox environment is typically isolated in such a way that any security issues occurring within that sandbox won't affect processes, systems or services outside of that sandbox. Sandboxes are typically used across browsers, virtual machines and other runtime environments. So you're probably using one right now. Basically, it's a defense in depth mechanism. So what kind of sandbox defense in depth mechanism are we looking at here exactly? Secomp. Okay, sounds scary, but what is it? Let's turn to our trusty friend, Wikipedia. Secomp, short for Secure Computing Mode, is a facility in the Linux kernel. Secomp allows a process to make a one-way transition into a secure state, where it cannot make any system calls except exit, sig return, read, and write to already open file descriptors. Should it attempt any other system calls, the kernel will terminate the process. So that's how the SecOMP sandbox works in general, basically by locking down the system calls a process can use. But for this challenge, those rules are defined a little differently than the Wikipedia definition. From lines 25 to 50 in the source code, we can see the exact SecOMP rules that are applied to this application. Basically, any system calls which aren't in this list, a bunch of which I don't even recognize or understand by the way, are not going to be allowed to be executed by the process operating within the SecOMP sandbox. So for example, we can use the write system call, but we can't use the read system call because it's not in this trusted list. Basically, these are the sandbox rules which are applied to our parent process, which is also the process which later executes our shellcode. So that also means 
These are the sandbox rules which we need to abide by with our shellcode too. But with these restrictions, what can we do with our shellcode anyway? Well now we know what the parent process does, but what about that fork child process? A function called check flag is probably going to be promising, so let's take a look at what that does. So the child process opens the flag at slash home slash user slash flag, then it reads four bytes of the flag file and closes the file descriptor. Next, it compares the bytes read from the flag file with ctf open bracket. Based on this information, we can be pretty sure this is the flag file we want to read in order to solve this challenge. But what's the bug here exactly? How can we abuse this application to read the flag? Well, let's recap what we have found so far. We have a process which forks itself. The parent process asks for some shellcode, sets up a restrictive seccomp sandbox and then executes the shellcode. The child process sits in a loop and continuously reads four bytes of the flag file. We know the flag location and we can execute shellcode. So an obvious approach here would be to try and use our shellcode to just read the flag. But thanks to seccomp and our limited list of system calls, reading and other useful flag grabbing functions are not allowed. However, there is an interesting oversight here in terms of the flow of execution. Since the seccomp sandbox is set up after the fork, the child process doesn't actually inherit or apply this strict profile. So to read the flag, we need to figure out a way to interact with the child process because that child process can do things that the sandboxed parent process cannot. But how can we interact with that child process? Well, there is a little trick here. We can make use of the sudo file system in slash proc. Proc is a special directory. This directory includes all kinds of information about the running system, configuration parameters, and most importantly for us, information about running processes. Specifically, we are interested in the slash proc slash process ID slash mem file, because this file shows the contents of the reference process ID's current memory contents. Why is this interesting? Well, from the parent process, we can't read anything, including the flag file, due to the restricted seccomp profile. However, the seccomp rules still allow us to write. So what happens if we can write to and change the instructions that the looping child process is executing in memory? But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves just yet. How do we know what process ID to reference in proc? Lucky for us, we don't need to mess around with the stack. The application just prints the process ID as a debug message. Now that we know the process ID, we can use slash proc to reference the memory of the child process from the parent process. In fact, we can do more than just reference it, we can write there too. But what do we want to write and where in the process memory do we want to write exactly? Well, let's take a look at the compilation flags of that compiled binary to see how we can answer that question. Good, we can see that PIE is disabled. With the position independent executable flag disabled, we can predict where relative functions and data will be in memory. So let's take a look in binary ninja and find that check flag function address. Ignoring the function prolog and focusing on that loop we can see some good candidate function addresses to start messing around with. Let's give ourselves the most space and choose the address at the start of this block, 40223a in hexadecimal. So once we have that process ID memory reference from proc, we now also know at what offset we want to perform our write. But what do we want to write? Well, we want to replace the currently running code with our own code. And as we saw before, that child process is not running within the seccomp sandbox. So if we can modify what the child process is executing, we can break out of the sandbox and gain access to our flag. Why is that? Because if we can overwrite the process's instructions in memory, when the application next executes the instructions stored in memory at that location, our shellcode will be executed instead. But what shellcode do we want to write? And more importantly, how can we actually write it there? Well, we need to attack this problem in stages using our limited set of available system calls from the parent process. The first part of our shellcode needs to open the proc sudo file 
Then the shell code needs to lseek to a specific offset address. lseek just repositions the file offset to the argument offset. So once we open the sudo file, we can then jump to that function offset address, which we already found. Next, we want to write something to that address. We also need to make sure to keep everyone happy. So we also need to use an infinite loop to keep the process alive after we mangled some instructions. But what is the something that we want to write? Well, the child process isn't restricted by the jail. So let's just get a regular old shell. So that's the plan. But before getting stuck into the hard stuff, let's first build out a template in Pawn Tools so we can more easily interface with the application. We set the architecture and log level, note down the offset where we want to write to, open up a connection to the challenge service and read out the child's process ID from the response. Next, we can set up the shell code we want to stage into the child process. Pawn Tools makes this easy. We can just call the shellcraft.sh function. Lastly, we tell the challenge how many bytes we want to write and then send the shell code. Well, it looks like setcomp is working pretty well because this shell code doesn't work and we don't get a shell. So let's start with the hard part, the custom staging shell code. When working directly with shellcode, system calls or syscalls will be our friends. A syscall lets us call a known function based on a number passed as a parameter. So for example, if we wanted to call read, we would use the syscall of zero to call the read function. I don't know about you, but I don't know my syscalls off by heart. Luckily, Pawn Tools does, so that makes life easy once again. So let's tackle this step by step. We want to be able to send our shellcode and our stage, so let's update the script. Then we can start to focus on the actual shellcode itself. But straight away, we run into a new problem. How do we know where our stage shellcode will actually be? We need to know where it is. Otherwise, how can we know where to write from? Let's take another look in Binary Ninja, but this time, let's take a look at what happens just before the shellcode is called and executed. Okay, so as part of regular program execution, our shellcode location is moved into the RAX register, then called. So that means when our first shellcode instruction is executed, that location itself must be stored in RAX. Since we know that current location, we can store an offset to our stage on the stack, then reference it again later when we need to perform our actual write. So now we can start writing our actual shellcode. Firstly, Let's add a number to RAX of a known offset for our buffer. Let's say 100 bytes. Then store that value on the stack so we can retrieve it later. Next, we can left adjust our shellcode with no operations or nops, so everything is nicely aligned. So now we have space to store the rest of our custom shellcode, as well as a known offset for where the actual stage location address is to be stored on the stack. With that information locked away, we can finally get started. First, we can open the proc file using the process ID we received from the server. Then, store that file descriptor returned in RAX on the stack. Next, we want to use lseek to move to our write offset index. Then we pop that stored file descriptor back off the stack. Next, we need to grab our stored stage location off the stack and put that into RBX. Finally, we write our shellcode to the child process memory and enter into an infinite loop. Seems reasonable, right? But how do we know we need to pop three values off the stack to get back to our stage offset location? Well, Pawn Tools is really helpful as always, but it also hides some important information from us. When debug mode is turned on and when executing the script, we can see what is being pushed and popped from the stack behind the scenes when Pawn Tools creates our ASM for us and our shellcode is executing. First, we can see the setup where we add 100 bytes to RAX and store that value on the stack. Then we start to prepare our open call by building the proc string on the stack. Then we set up the actual syscall and then make that underlying syscall. A similar preparation and calling process is also used for lseek, but the end results of these syscalls is that the location of the stage which we saved at the start of our shellcode is now pushed farther down the stack. 
So we need to pop it out to get back to that saved location before finally making our right call. So enough talking. What happens when we actually execute this script? We get code execution on the remote server outside of the SecOps sandbox and can finally read the flag. So just to recap our approach here. From the parent process, which is stuck in the SecOMP sandbox jail, we can write to the child processor's memory to break out of the jail, gain arbitrary code execution, and ultimately read the flag. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. It really helps the channel grow if you comment, like, and subscribe below. Also, if you're interested in solving capture the flag challenges across a range of traditional Jeopardy-based categories, make sure to check out 247ctf.com.